Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. Spring is in full bloom, so we're celebrating at one of our favorite places, the 17th Annual Orchid Show at the New York Botanical Garden. This year's inspiration is Singapore with a city in a garden. Many of the world's most beautiful and exotic orchids stem from this region, including the hybrid orchid, line-covered arches, and the elaborate, colorful trees. Now, here's a look at what's ahead on our show. Autism in the Asian American Community, Minnie Rose Special Report in honor of National Autism Awareness Month. Playing with a full deck, Kyung Yoon learns the tricks of the trade with magician David Fang. Rainer Ramirez takes us inside Insurrecto, the Philippine-American War, with award-winning author Gina Apostol. And I stay on point with Ballet Hispanico. This and more on Asian American Life. I'm Minnie Rome. During the month of April, homes and landmarks across the country will light up blue in honor of National Autism Awareness Month. Over the years, the number of individuals living with autism spectrum disorder continues to rise. And we wanted to highlight some of the many advances made in this field, including the contributions of Asian Americans who are creating positive change for those living with this disorder. Hey, everybody do this. Hey, everybody do this. This may seem like a typical school. You measure one cup. Where students learn math. Go to gym class. Create beautiful music and masterpieces in art. <laughs> but this is not a typical school. Every one of these students at the Reed Academy in Oakland, New Jersey, is living with autism spectrum disorder. Students here not only learn academics, but also learn how to live independently, engaging in real life scenarios. At the nurse's office, Matthew is practicing for a trip to the dentist. Jonathan already went shopping for his ingredients, and now he's cooking his lunch. Tell me what happens in this room. So this room is our apartment. Students learn how to make a bed. They learn how to keep a room clean. They learn how to fold their laundry and put their laundry away. I know that what we're doing at Reed Academy, I know that the skills that we're teaching our kids and the lessons that we're teaching them and the functional skills that we're teaching them are going to literally make an imprint in their lives. According to the Center for Disease Control, one out of every 59 children in the United States is living with autism. ASD is four times more likely to affect boys than girls and occurs in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Warning signs include delayed speech, and in severe cases, an inability to communicate, an aversion to touch, repetitive or restrictive patterns of behavior, poor social skills, ADHD, and an avoidance of eye contact. Julie Azuma is the mother of a child living with autism. Her daughter is now 30 and in a group home. But when Miranda was growing up in the 1990s, Azuma remembers the frustration of not being able to find the right learning materials that were recommended for her daughter by psychologists. I want you to get blocks with no numbers or letters on it. I want you to get a big sock and a little sock, and a big ball and a little ball. I want you to get pictures of everybody in your family. There's a lot of stuff to try and put together. Azuma created a company called Different Roads to Learning to help other parents in her situation. Today, her company supplies materials to autism schools across the country. Reed Academy is one of her clients. Back in the day, people really felt that we were the, the place to come for the things that they needed. Because, because we're so specific about applied behavior analysis and verbal behavior intervention, they knew to come to us. Especially coming from an Asian family, I actually see a lot of this hidden in the communities where the parents are kind of like, I would say, ashamed to talk about it and they are ashamed to admit it. So they hide this disorder from their relatives, from their friends, and even from the community. And as a result, the children really don't get the 
need the help that they need. Lisa Yang and her husband have three children. Their youngest two are on the spectrum. My son wasn't diagnosed until he was much older, even though he presented with some of these very challenging behaviors, like the screaming, and he was very difficult to try to train. In her quest to help her children, Yang discovered what she calls a woeful inadequacy in funding for autism research in this country. It was an alarming red flag to her, especially when coupled with CDC data that shows in the past two decades, the number of individuals living with ASD in the United States has more than doubled. When you look at the amount of funding, not only from private sources, but also from government sources like NIH, you really don't see that kind of funding that should be commensurate with huge numbers of people that are going to be going old. And how are they going to find jobs? Where are they going to get support system from, the family, or whether it's a public system? Yang and her husband established the Hawk E. Tan and K. Lisa Yang Center for Autism Research at MIT, which has produced significant research papers, such as this one, which links bacterial infections in a pregnant woman's digestive tract to a higher risk of having a child with autism. Recently, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a similar study looking at Swedish babies born over a 30-year period whose exposure to infection while in utero significantly increased their risk for ASD and depression. Guoping Feng is a neuroscientist with the Tan Yang Center. So there's no one common thing um, cause autism. The major cause contributing factor for autism spectrum disorder is genetic factors. Even within the genetics, there are many, many different genes. Hundreds of them have been linked to the autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Feng says there are an infinite combination of factors, environmental and diet included, that could cause ASD. And no one person with autism is identical to another. But Dr. Feng is cautiously optimistic that his team has successfully isolated one possible cause, a monogenetic mutation, otherwise a single gene mutation that can be linked to some symptoms of ASD. We have now much better understanding of the molecular, cellular, and circuit mechanisms of autism spectrum disorders. Now we are, can think about how do we develop a treatment for these problems. Back at Reed Academy, it's goodbye until tomorrow, when they do it all over again. Until they turn 21 and age out of school-based autism services to enter the Medicaid system. Over the next decade, an estimated 500,000 teens with ASD will enter adulthood. Sad fact is that there are not enough excellent quality adult day programs. And for a lot of adults, they end up sitting at home. And when an adult is sitting at home, they're not working, they're not a resource in the community, they're losing many of the skills that they have spent years learning in school, and it really becomes a disservice as a uh, community and ultimately as a country, I think that we are really falling short on. In order to bridge the gap between the school entitlement funding and Medicaid, Nadison spearheaded a social enterprise called Greens Do Good, a four-season hydroponic vertical farm that will eventually employ adults with autism, with the proceeds from the farm going back into Read Next, the foundation's adult program. Nadison hopes to make Greens Do Good a model for other nonprofits. We're all doing it with the same goals in mind, and we're all doing it to make a difference in the lives of kids and families with autism. According to JAMA, the total cost of supporting an individual with ASD over his or her lifetime can amount to just over $2 million, most of that due to loss of parental earnings. By the year 2025, the total cost of caring for Americans with ASD is expected to rise to about $461 billion. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. I'm Kyung Yoon. Magic. It's a word that has the power to make us suspend disbelief, even for a moment. 
while I met up with a young Asian American magician and mentalist who's breaking into the field with a full deck. We've got two cards. This is a money card. All you need to care about is a money card, right? So if I go like this, where's the money card? Here. Exactly, right? Meet David Fang, a talented young magician you should never, ever make a bet on with a card, something I learned the hard way. All right, mm -hmm. so where's the money card? Here. Right, that's where um, actually I built you with the false confidence and you mm -hmm. should actually get it wrong. Oh no! The money card is actually here. <laughs> um, now you lost $10, but that's okay, we'll keep playing. <laughs> The 27-year-old New Yorker says he first got interested in magic when he was laid up in bed following knee surgery while in college. I first started off watching a lot of like Korean dramas, actually. Like I was on my bed, so like I couldn't do anything. But then I realized maybe I should learn something productive. So that's kind of how magic came into play. Nowadays, it, it's, it's a blessing to have YouTube, for example, right? Um, YouTube, you can learn like the basic magic there. So you didn't really need to have to buy books, I think, versus maybe 20, 30 years ago, I don't think there was, I wouldn't have even the opportunity to learn magic just because I was on my bed. I would have to like physically go to a bookstore and actually buy magic books. So that's kind of how I initially got the basic knowledge. By watching YouTube videos. Yeah, there's a lot actually, if you're interested there, just actually like on the basics of it. He soon discovered he had a gift for magic and developed a passion for performing that helped him to overcome his natural shyness. When you actually do get to perform and people give you positive feedback, that's really all you need to keep going. Once you start performing and you do well, and then people say, oh, it's amazing how you do it. And then you realize, huh, that's something that maybe is worth my time. So the positive reinforcement. I think that's very important, yeah. From Houdini to Penn and Teller to David Copperfield, Magic is a field that has not showcased many Asians. That is, until just this February, when Shin Lim, a Canadian-American of Chinese heritage, won the top champion's prize at America's Got Talent, paving the way for up-and-comers like David. Uh, my name is David Fang. I am a performing magician and mentalist. I am 27. The young magician recently made a splash of his own on Asia's Got Talent where he astonished the audience by having one of the judges pick freely from a box of crayons to color a picture, then magically producing an identical replica of her color choices. You will see the exact wow. same coloring. No way. But while David says he enjoys performing in front of cameras and celebrities, he also makes a point of sharing his magic with many different audiences, like this group of inmates in jail. That's a free choice, yeah, you pick any card you like. Because I think at the end of the day, magic is the same. It doesn't matter if you do magic for someone that, you know, has a million dollars versus someone that doesn't have anything. Their reaction is the same. So I kind of want to be able to, to kind of witness and also capture that universality of when people react to magic, that amazement. So. That's kind of how I wanted to, you know, do magic for people in jail or people that are homeless. Um, is to kind of like showcase that side of the, that humanity is, is kind of universal. And he certainly had me amazed when he asked me to think of a card, any card. And, well, see what happened. I, w I don't want you to think of the ace of spades. Ace of spades is way too easy. Uh, you can think of maybe cards as high as the um, king and queen of diamond, as low as the two or three of club. Let me know when you have it in your mind, right? So if you can imagine kind of like the spots of the card, you've got a card in your mind, right? You're thinking of it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right, so I'm actually, I'm gonna place a card here. So I'm committed, right? I can't really change my mind. And, and again, we've never set anything up together. I didn't tell you to pick a card, right? Mm -mm. You did not. All right, so if I mess up, uh, it's fine. But um, for the first time, what card were you thinking of? The Eight of Hearts. Eight of Hearts, yeah. Would you mind turning it over? Oh my goodness. Eight of Hearts, so. <laughs> That's incredible. And David Fang says he wants to keep performing for audiences from all walks of life. 
who can share in the universal wonder and power of magic. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. We recognize that history is largely written by the victors, but a new novel by writer Gina Apostol is flipping the script on a little known event in the Philippine American War. Author Gina Apostol's new novel, Insurrecto, sheds light on the Philippine American War that spanned from 1899 to 1901. It's a war that's, in my view, hugely immoral. It's a war that changed the concept of America. America went from a republic to empire. The Philippine-American War, reenacted in these films, came at the heels of the Spanish-American War of 1898, when the U.S. fought alongside Filipinos to oust 400 years of Spanish colonial rule from the islands. But the Philippines did not gain independence. Instead, the Philippines was essentially bought by the United States under the Treaty of Paris for $20 million. That shift, I think, is problematic for Americans to think about, that this republic, based on their declaration of independence, actually occupied this country um, that was at war for independence. Filipinos continued to fight for independence. An estimated 4,200 American soldiers and more than 200,000 Filipinos were killed. One of the bloodiest events occurred at Balangiga in the island of Samar in 1901, when Filipino revolutionaries, led by a woman named Casiana Nacionales, rose up against the American military. The Filipinos killed up to 48 soldiers. And in retaliation, uh, the general at the time, Jacob Smith, they killed... 3,000 to 30,000 Filipinos. While the number of Filipinos killed at the Balangiga massacre is ambiguous, it made headlines in the United States. The deaths in Samar of Filipinos created an outcry also um, in the United States, created a congressional hearing about the prosecution of this war, um, the concern that there was in fact genocide going on. And so I looked at that, at, at the uprising. I wanted to see it from the Filipino side. Insurrecto, which means insurgent in English, begins in contemporary Philippines under President Rodrigo Duterte. It's told through the lens of two women on a journey to investigate the Balangiga massacre. There's Chiara, an Italian-American filmmaker writing a script about the subject, and the Filipino-American translator she hires named Magsaline. When Magsaline reads Chiara's script, she begins to write her own version about the massacre. I wanted duality. I think readers end up trying to figure out who is writing which script. And that kind of overlapping and confusion and misrecognition and miside misidentification that keeps happening um, with who's writing which script, I think is really interesting and important. Um, almost as almost as a kind of, it's almost ontological. It's almost like a sense of how we experience um, colonialism in some ways. Apostol uses humor to rewrite a history written largely by the victors and draws parallels between the atrocities of the Philippine-American War and President Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs. And if you look at the photographs, if you look at the way, the, you know, the photographs of the Filipino-American War in the, stereo, in the stereo cards, the photographs of the dead in Duterte, there isn't much difference. Structurally, they're, they're the same. There's a, a, a violent, a malignant military power going out, um, creating a victim. In the case of the Filipino-American War, it's the Katipuneros, insurrectos, as they call them, which is a pejorative term and not really the term that Filipinos would use. You're insurrecto, it's okay to kill you. You are a drug person, it's okay to kill you. Structurally, they're the same. They're different you know, labels. Insurrecto has received critical praise in the Philippines and in the U.S., including the New York Times and NPR. We have multiplicity, and the more we recognize that we are not singular, we're not just one entity, you're able to recognize yourself in others, as opposed to have empathy for someone who's an other. You recognize, oh, you're a part of me, you know? So for the Filipino, oh, uh, that, group is a part of me. This American monster is a part of me, you know, that has, has uh, that um, this uh, American imperial machine. Uh, for the American to recognize, oh, 
Duterte's horror, that's part of me. Insurrecto is available online and in bookstores near you. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. From beautiful flowers to beautiful dancing. Coming up, we go behind the scenes at Ballet Hispanico, where a Filipino-American choreographer is about to take a big leap. Five, six, seven, eight. For the last few months, Benny Royce Royan has been homebound. Homebound Ala Ala is his latest dance creation, and we got to watch Royan in action as he worked with the dancers at Ballet Hispanico preparing for the world premiere at the Joyce Theater. It's about love, uh, longing, loss, and also celebrating a sense of like resilience together. And what really inspired me to to tackle all of that is, I'm gonna get te teared up. My family, yeah. So that kind of journeying, like how do, how do we get here? How do, how do we get from point A to point B? Through dance and movement, Royan's work tackles themes of immigration and migration, while also exploring the connections between the Latinx and Asian diaspora. It was a theme that intrigued Ballet Hispanico's CEO and artistic director, Eduardo Villaro. What I wanted to do uh, because of my personal um, uh, Asian legacy and heritage, I wanted to celebrate that and show everyone else that the Hispanic diaspora has intersected with many diasporas and how beautiful that is. And so in that intersection of culture, what are our similarities? What are our, our differences? And how can we come together to celebrate them? So how did Royan, a Filipino-American, get from point A to choreographing a dance with the country's leading Latino dance company? Let's start in the beginning. Royan moved to the United States when he was 12. It was actually a leap year, February, yeah, uh, 1996, I believe. I was 12 years old, and um, I grew up in Seattle. And um, I was born in the Philippines, uh, in Laguna. His mother, aunt, and grandmother were overseas Filipino workers when Royan's mom met his dad. They all reunited as a family in Seattle, where Royan grew up. You know, my first contact of movement, really, when I was growing up in um, grade school, was folk dance, Filipino folk dance. So I learned tinikling, um, you know, calisthenics, and things like that, the maglalatik, which is in the piece. Right, with the coconuts? I saw I'm like, that. how can I use that? And I know that dance, because yeah. I also belong to a yes. Filipino dance troupe. Yes. I didn't uh, really receive form formal training, like Western training, like ballet, until I was about 16. And two years, I decided at 16 that this is what, uh, this is what I was going to do. The dance training changed his life's trajectory. Two years later, he was on a plane to New York to attend the prestigious Juilliard School, where he majored in dance. He went on to work on several Broadway and off-Broadway productions. But Homebound, Ala Ala, which means to remember in Filipino, is his biggest, most challenging, and most complete work as a choreographer. I think I'm in a place now in my life where I'm looking inward to go forward. Um, I think as an artist, you can't um, help but be affected by what's going on around, especially in the climate that we live in now. So I'm not a very political person, but I, I do like to, to really um, find and use my art form to understand everything that's happening around. He knew it was ready to launch on a bigger stage, so he called Valaro. I get choreographers who invite me to their showings, and I went to the showing, and I saw the work, and I was really intrigued by the way he uses partnering, his movement vocabulary was really interesting to me. That's the beauty of this organization, of Ballet Hispanico, because we fuse, we take the contemporary with the traditional, and then we allow for the artist's voice to come through and give everyone else their lens. And it led Royan here with Ballet Hispanico's company dancers bringing his work to life. Royan infuses Filipino culture in his dance, from the chinelas, slippers, to the cargo boxes many Filipinos use to send gifts back home to family. 
but the underlying theme is movement, immigrating to the United States, moving away from home, chasing your dreams. And just like the title, Homebound Ala Ala, it also means never forgetting where you came from. Ala Ala means to remember or a remembrance, you know. So, so I just want to present that to myself and to our community and also beyond the, the Phil M community, you know, other, other groups of people, you know. We have to remember, you know, what it was, how, how we got here, how we got here from, the, you know, in the first place. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. If you want to learn more about our stories, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to check out the 17th Annual Orchid Show here at the New York Botanical Garden. The exhibit will be up until the end of the month. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time. <laughs>